story of how he saved us from our most desperate, desperate times. There have been several times in my life, and I I just felt like God wanted us to share with each other this morning. There have been many, many times where things have taken place, things have happened, and I was done. I just wanted so much to give up, so much to just end it, so much to hide to the place where, like, you know, you're, you're in such a desperate way, and that's where the enemy takes us. He takes us to that place because he literally wants us to take our life. He literally wants us to end it. He wants us, we can end it because we take our life. We can end it because we stop loving. We stop trusting. He can end it because we stop believing. And I'm just going to, like, there's (laughs) my life. (laughs) There have been times where he was the only thing that kept me from ending things for my life. Like where, like, I remember calling my sister when there was a breakup in my first marriage. And I was in the bathtub and I was like, I am done. I am done. I am done with this. I can't do this anymore. And so she, Actually, she called me, and we began to talk, and I began to share with her. And she started talking about how much Jesus was there. He would take care of it. He would get me through. And with everything I had, I just had to turn to him. I had to turn to him and let his love give me hope. And I'm telling you, if you've been through anything like that, and if you haven't, you probably will. Because what God shows us is that he's there for us in the darkest times. And then he shows it to us so that we'll feel his hope, we'll feel his love, we'll rise above, we'll rise out of that pit, and then we'll be able to tell others, this is what Jesus does. This is what Jesus does. Don't give up. Don't give up. That man who was in the coffin and he had the light, he had the one light, that's all that was left. But guess what? Jesus sees that. He sees that from the time that you get attacked by the enemy He sees that by the time you are betrayed. He sees that by the time you are grieving. He sees that light. And he sends his love to the rescue. And that's what we're for, too. That's what we're for today. If we have felt that love, if we have felt that hope, if we have felt that hope bring us out of the pit, he says, can you let your light shine? for men so they can see your good works they can see that Jesus rescued you and they can run to him and they're not afraid and I'm telling you I just feel this so strong like there's so many people who are at the end of their rope like that little girl who jumped into the ro- into the river but you know what Jesus says uh uh-uh. uh He says, no. He gives us a choice. We can choose. And you can share the love of Jesus, but people can choose. He will never take that away. He will never take that. That's love. Love is in the freedom of choosing. You can choose to give your life away. You can choose to give it to the enemy. You can choose to give in to the depression and the grief and the fear, and the doubt. You can choose to give in to the lust. You can choose to give in to the evil. You have that choice. 
Jesus is never going to come in and go, oh, no, you can't do that. He's not going to do that. He's not church. He's not about doing good. He's about love. He's about love. Love, love, love. And love is freedom. It's freedom to choose who you're going to love and who you're going to serve. But he just says, I'm here and I will save you from all of it with my love. So I think this morning we're, we're just going to sing it again and we're going to say, Lord, Lord, come into us by your Holy Spirit. Open our eyes. Open our eyes to see your hope as we just put this into words and we put this into music and we let it absorb into our heart and we let it absorb into our, you know what? Because I believe it's already gone into your heart, but now it's got to, your mind has to let go. We have to let go. We have to say enough is enough. I'm done. But I choose you, Jesus, and I'm going to let you love me till your kingdom comes and and that's what we have to do and that's what we have to tell people just let go and let God love you let him forgive you receive his forgiveness receive because then what happens is his power comes after that when we let it says the weak are strong the weak are strong so when we let go of our own power our own strength because, you know, a lot of us, we think we're so strong and we think we are the strong one. But when we let go of it, we're going to find out what true power is because it'll come from our Heavenly Father. So let's just sing it together one more time. Amen? This is what the Lord wants you to know. When this song, when we sing, when I was a sinner, he saved me from who I was, it's not saving us from who we are. It's saving us from sin. When God created Adam and Eve and he created the garden, he created it perfect. Everything was perfect. No sin. That's his plan for us. No sin no sickness, no death, because we're going to live eternally. We're going to live forever with him. Death has lost its power over us when we believe in Jesus. So it's not that he's changing you into something you aren't. He's changing you into who you were created to be. Amen. Your divine purpose, your holy purpose. Divine design. I think the biggest reason is that we've taken it on like a club or a tradition or a to-do or a, you know, I don't know, something good to do that brings some goodness to us because we've done something good. But I'm going to tell you what church is about today in 2024. It's about war. It's about warfare. It's about warfare. It's about God's believers, God's people coming together and throwing off this world and saying, no more, no more enemy, no more. And Jesus said, I'm going to make it so simple that no church, because how many divisions are there now? How many 30, thousands? How many? 33,000. Christian denominations. Okay. 33,000 Christian denominations that have split up into different things, right? And Jesus is saying, uh-uh. There's one way, one way. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's his name. It's his power. Jesus. His way that's or why, way. that's where the power is. That's what breaks the stronghold. You'll see so many people doing different formulas, doing different things. Uh-uh. It's his name. He made it that way for a purpose because he is the power. He is the healing. 
Who needs healing this morning? Who needs healing? Anybody? Anybody need healing? Do you know anybody who needs healing? I saw Corey limp across the thing this morning. (laughs) We need healing. We need power. Who needs power? Who needs power, Ali? You need power? We need power. We need power. His name is power. His name is healing. His name is life. Amen. His name and his name alone. So, yeah, we... We could sit here and do our religious tradition and you say, you know, do that kind of thing. But I say, no, we are here to win the battle because he already won it. He won it on Calvary. He did it all. We don't, we just carry on that. We just ride on his victory, people. We ride on his victory. We ride on his healing, his power. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen Amen means you agree. Let's say amen. Amen. Say amen. 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 God hears it in the heavenlies. Jesus hears it in the heavenlies. And he has sent his Holy Spirit here this morning to minister that to our hearts. Amen? Amen. 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 So let's say your name is power. Your name is power. Oh, we're off. (laughs) I guess we have to start at the beginning. (laughs) Um, Every time we sing, burn like a fire, I just wanted to say it makes me think of Joey. When me and Joey and mom and dad were in their living room and we had a pastor preaching on the TV at the time. I don't remember who mom knows. Rodney Howard Brown. Rodney Howard Brown. And he was saying, light that fire underneath you. Light that flame. Are we on fire for God? Mm -hmm. If we're not on fire for God, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. It's like she says, we can come to church every Sunday and follow through the steps and take our communion and say, okay, I'll pray for you and go back home and start over and mm-hmm. continue that. Mm-hmm. But if we're not on fire for God, amen. what are we doing? Amen, amen. We need to light all fires yes. and burn for Jesus. Yes. And that's, I think of Joey, yeah, little Joey, <laughs> raising his hands and praising Jesus with everything he had because he know? had that fire lit. He did. <laughs> and he still does. He, he does. still holds that fire inside of him. <laughs> And that was my little testimony for that part. (laughs) Amen. Amen. Jesus, I pray for your Holy Spirit to burn in us today. Burn in us, Lord. Burn out the dross. Burn out the fear. Burn out the sin. Burn out anything that's holding us back from you, Lord. We pray, Holy Spirit, come in power and might and in fire. We pray it this morning. And we believe it together by faith because your word says where we come together, where two or more come believing in that, that you are there in the midst. And then all things are possible. Amen. Amen. Praise you, Jesus. We thank you and we give you glory and we look forward to the word of God the power and the word of God to come into our life this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So when we were up there singing that song, My little testimony is that God would light a fire under every one of those chairs that would make every one of you guys stand up out there and raise your hands and worship. Amen? Because I was sitting there thinking, like, you're not going to be sitting your butts down in the kingdom of heaven when Jesus is up there. We'll probably be on your faces falling down, but, you know, you might be up there raising your hands, clapping, and praising the Lord. You know? This church was known for its worship. And the worship that was brought into this place by God because there was a heart in each one of us that just so longed to worship God. And God puts that in you. 
I mean, if you feel the urge that you want to get up and praise the Lord and raise your hands, go with that. That's the Holy Spirit telling you, get up and praise. Because, you know, sometimes when we do that, in obedience to God, that breakthrough happens in your life. Sometimes when you're hearing like the still small voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to you, saying, you know what? Who cares who's watching you stand up and worship and clap or dance? And you know, and the minute you do that in obedience to God, sometimes that's when he will bring that healing that you need to your body or that freedom that sets you free from that bondage that keeps you from obeying. You know, break every bondage, break every stronghold, break every chain like we just sang. And when we do that, and when you step out in faith, I mean, it just takes a step out in faith. And when you step out like that, that's when that breakthrough happens in your life that you so long for, that you need so much. Okay? I don't care. You know, I, didn't, I tried combing my hair this morning, you know. I'm the only brother in my family that still has hair on his head. And I'm telling you, I'm getting close, you know. So, but I don't care how my, you know, I want to take my hat off for God and respect. And also to respect my wife, <laughs> too. Because she always says, take your hat off in church. And it's true, you should not have a hat on in church, but sometimes I do. But anyways... Praise the Lord. So I wanted to just share that with you. You know, um, worship is probably one of the most powerful weapons we have in the spirit realm. It's our worship and praise to God. I remember my mother-in-law and father-in-law, when we first built our house up here on the hill, they actually had, down in that lower pasture down there, there's a little creek down there, just kind of like to the right of our pond, where our pond was, there was an actual outdoor stage that was out there. And the cable is probably is still run, because I know I got the big old breaker in the back that goes out to that area where they actually had outdoor concerts and celebrations that went for weekends, if not weeks. And there would be thousands of people on this hill running around praising and worshiping God. So that's a little bit of a history fact. And then when we came, it was beyond repair at that time, the stage was. And we ended up, you know, bulldozing the thing out of there. And Christmas trees were overgrown because there used to be, our, that field over there behind the church wasn't a field. It was Christmas trees that were all overgrown. So when we built our house. So, but all of that to say, this whole property has been dedicated to the worship and praise of God. And, you know, we, as Julie and I, when we purchased the church from Mom, we felt like we've been gatekeepers, like Nehemiah rebuilding the wall, but gatekeepers and keeping things going. Wanting to keep things going and keep the call that was on her father's life, Howard, and her mother, Joan, because they could have went and bought a condo in Florida, and they probably wish they did right now, but instead they said, you know what, we can do this, or we can build a church for the kingdom of God and for God. And they chose, I believe, the right thing to do. They chose to build a church. And we need to keep that, and we've been called to keep that going. But now I'm calling for all of us to help build this church. You know, we're in these times where they're crazy times. You know, I'm going to go over a little bit with my sermon. And I'm sorry, but I have a long sermon today. <laughs> so, but you know what? The church is getting warmer now. And if you get cold, you can stand up and clap your hands and do jumping jacks. I don't know. Whatever you want to do. Push up jumping jacks. But it's getting warmer in here. Praise the Lord. So before we get started, time for Grace to come on down and we can take up an offering. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. So before you guys give an offering, and I want to teach you this, and I, and I probably have already, but before you give an offering, you always ask God what you should give, 
And you always should pray about it. You should always pray, Lord, I want this to be a blessing to you, but I also know that your word says that, Lord, if we give to you, that you will multiply it. I pray that you would multiply my seeds that I give and that you would bless my family abundantly and you would multiply them. So take a moment and just think about what you need. Pray that God would bless your finances, that he would multiply your finances because God is Jehovah Jireh. You know, God is our provider. He multiplies. It's his, his, I'd rather go with God's economy than I want to say Biden's, Biden's economy right now, but, or the world's economy, okay? Let's put it that way. So I'm believing in God's economy and not the world's economy. So, Father, I thank you and praise you, Lord God, for these tithes and offerings that you're bringing in this place. I pray that you would multiply, Lord God, our giving. Lord God, that you would multiply, Lord God, not just the work of our hands and bless the work of our hands, but, Lord, you would bring in that miracle money. That, Lord God, you know we all need. And, Lord God, we know that we all are believing and standing in faith that you're going to provide for us. Because you are Jehovah Jireh. It doesn't matter what goes on to the left. It doesn't matter what goes on in, in the world's economy or our government's economy. We're in the kingdom's economy. And we're trusting and believing on that, Lord God, where rust and moth will not destroy, Lord God, and where there is no crashes. We're just trusting in you. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. amen. Okay. <clears throat> so, the beginning of my sermon is going to be kind of like a little world update, really quick. And I want to share because this week, um, this week, Julie and I have been reading our Bibles like we should. You know, my wife is way more better at it than I am in keeping me accountable. You know, that's why God sends a wife to a man to help him. And that's what she's called the helper, right? So I, I give the praise to my wife for reading the word. We've read through um, Colossians and we read through Galatians. But we are also sharing and talking about it. But we also watch uh, this, you know, we do watch Christian shows too and preaching on TV. And we were listening to Rick Joyner, who's the head pastor, head pastor, pastor, head pastor of, like a senior pastor of Morningstar. That's down in South Carolina. We've been to their meetings before. Julie and I have actually driven down there to the meetings. But, and they're all, a lot of the prophets, and Rick Joyner is really a prophetic man. Their ministry is based on prophecy and, and, and being prophetic. But one thing he said is that 2024, prepare for war. 2024, prepare for war. That was his opening statement. Now, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to figure out this. World is in turmoil. I believe it's the birth pains that the Bible talks about, and we're going to get into that. That's in Matthew 24. Joe's going to put the scriptures up on the board. It is, I believe it's the birth pains. Now, the birth pains in the Bible are just before the tribulation period of time, where all these events start taking place. But I want you to be aware of what is going on, especially in the Middle East. And with Israel, because we should always be praying for Israel. Right? Always be praying for the peace of Israel. For one, what's happened in the last week that I, that I know of, and there's probably way more that's happened, you know, because I just get glimpses like headlines of news flashes and stuff like that, and then I look into them a little bit. But I know that they're trying to um, say that Israel's causing war crimes. I know the leader of South Africa was saying he, he was put up to it by other leaders to come out against Israel, that they're committing war crimes by what's going on over there in Gaza. Which to me, it just totally is crazy because 
They're not saying what the Hamas has done to Israel is any war crime either. You know, when you, when you have a neighboring country that tears down the wall, runs in there and massacres, you know, thousands of people, you know, and they're not even military personnel, they're civilians, they're women and children, right, and families, you know, they're not saying what they've done or what they're doing is any war crime. The torturing of children and women, it's unbelievable over there. So it's, it's a total, it's a total, um, it's almost like a total world alliance against Israel right now, which is terrible. Iran has taken an oil ship this week that I know of, and I think it's an American oil ship, and has taken those people captive for hostages, right, over in the Red Sea. And there's been a lot of things going on in the Red Sea, just so you know, uh, in the world, what's going on over there. They're, they're trying to bomb. Iran is attacking all these ships. And the Red Sea is like a third of the whole world's um, exporting and importing. I mean, everything, a lot of things come in and out of the Red Sea that affect the whole world, all right? So be prepared for more price increases on everything and all goods, you know, that come out of there, especially on oil and gasoline. Um, the American em Embassy, which this is stuff that just baffles me. Like, I can't understand why this is not on our headline news. Like, I haven't heard any of the major news channels talk about the American embassy in Iraq that's been bombed. I mean, that's the American embassy in our, that's our embassy. You know, and we are ambassadors for Christ. An embassy is an ambassador of the United States for that country. And it's also a place for Americans to go if they're in that country, if it's under attack, for safety. But those embassies are like one of the first targets the enemy attacks because they don't apply by NATO rules. They don't go by the same rules that we are held accountable for. All right? They're, a, they're like two standards. So that happened. The, uh, the United States Embassy in Iraq was bombed. They've been getting, like, our military bases over there in Iraq in the area have been targeted and been bombed several times. You know, but a lot, a lot of this stuff is being publicized. They're not voicing it. Uh, the United States and the UK together targeted over 66 locations in Yemen for bombing the Houthis, because the Houthis are the ones responsible for, for a lot of the attacks in the Red Sea. But the United States and the UK, and there's something else in there too that I saw in, the, in one of my things that I watch, is that there is a coalition of nations coming together. There's a lot of nations coming together. You know, aligning themselves together with each other. Now, Turkey, usually, which is, this is totally crazy. This is what's, this is what's totally crazy about the Middle East. The Americans go in and liberate these countries, right, from oppression and everything else. But then, and then we go and we rebuild all these countries you know, like Turkey was really going to be under attack by Russia, but America went in during the Cold War, Cold War days. This was Gorbachev and Reagan days, you know, during the Cold War days, and they helped rebuild Turkey and help their infrastructure, just like we've done over in Iraq. You know, we spent billions of our money in all these countries to rebuild them, and then these countries who you think because of all the help that you've done to help rebuild them, would align themselves with you, right, in the Middle East, that they would be your friend and not your foe. Well, Turkey's decided to go, to go with Palestine and with Russia over this whole thing with Israel, which makes no sense. They're actually calling Hamas a freedom liberators. They're praising them for what they're doing, which is insane, which they're hiding behind hospitals, they're hiding behind residential homes and all these tunnels. They're using civilians as shields to protect them, which is insane. Which is that's not you know that's not right. Another thing that's happened too is that 
Israel is now being attacked again by the northern border. And this started when the whole Hamas thing started. But Hezbollah, Hezbollah is another terrorist group. They're larger than Hamas. They got 150,000 troops. They got, they're much more organized. They're more funded by Iran, which is the head of this whole thing. They're starting to launch missiles. And this was it last night or this morning. I saw that they were testing the Iron Dome. I think it was last night that Hamas or Hezbollah started launching mis missiles into Israel and they were testing the Iron Dome. They are seeing what they can get in there and get out and actually some of the missiles. The Iron Dome doesn't get them all. The Iron Dome is so specialized weaponry. It's amazing how the Iron Dome actually works. So if there's a missile that's coming in, um, from like Hezbollah, northern Israel, northern, northern Libya, that's where Hezbollah is at, or the Gaza Strip, which is on the west side of Israel, right? If there's a missile that comes in and the Iron Dome deems that that missile is not a threat, this is how much technology there is. It'll let that missile go because it knows that missile is not going to hit a populated area. If it's going to hit out in the desert, the Iron Dome won't waste its time. You know, those missiles won't waste its time trying to hit down a missile that it's not going to affect anybody. It's just going to land out in the middle of nowhere. Those things are so smart. Weaponry and technology today is so smart, it's scary. All right? We don't even know. You know, I know when I served in the military that what they told us, you know, and what they told civilians are two different things, okay? And, and they had weaponry back then that I was hearing that would be so specifically pinpointed that it would take out a certain ethnicity, right? Which now is so scary in the world because of the anti-Semitism has gone so high. And trust me, you know, what they've done in our country with racism and everything and how they've divided our country and they, they make you sound like a racist when you're not a racist, you know, and how they've done that and set it up, our country is a divided country right now. It's scary. I mean, it's a scary time to be in the world living up and, and growing up, to be living in and growing up in. But, I mean, I, I look back, and, and I know my family's got Jewish blood in them. We have Jewish blood in us, you know. And probably every single one of you out there have Jewish blood in you because we're all children of Abraham. You know, you know, we're all children of Adam, Adam and Eve at some point. You know, it goes way back there. But we are actually, I know, I know for myself and for my family and my brother, my grandmother was a Benjamin. She was a Jew. She didn't practice Judaism, but her maiden name was Benjamin. You know, so that's, we have Jewish blood in us. And I'm just telling you all this stuff because things in this world are escalating. Jesus' return is imminent. He can come any time. Right? But I'm saying this so that you can be prepared. So that you can be prepared spiritually. I mean, it's nice to prepare physically. You know, we should be wise. We should always have some extra supplies on hand, extra water. and You know, don't forget toilet paper because you know what happened during the pandemic. You know, the pandemic. The run on toilet paper, you couldn't get that, TP. That's got to have that, right? <laughs> but it's always smart to have some supplies in your house. I look at it like this, you know what? If we have supplies in our house and we prepare for it, then if Jesus comes and takes us all away in the rapture, praise the Lord, that's great. We just help somebody else maybe survive through the tribulation period if they come and find our house and their supplies in there, maybe that would help them out. Maybe they'll find a Bible in there and they'll read it and they'll read all our highlight parts. Maybe they'll get sermon notes and read them and maybe get an understanding of what actually is happening in the world. So, but these are all the birth pains. You know, and, and I do preach a lot on the end times because we are, I believe, in the end times. And we need to be prepared for what's coming. You know, in my military training in the service was a Cav Scout. I'm, 
I was a 19 Delta One Papa Romeo A. I was an airborne paratrooping cab scout. My job was to find the enemy, do not engage the enemy, but report his location, his strengths, his weaponry, and all this other good stuff. I didn't have a long life expectancy because they didn't live too long, you know, but that was my job. But I couldn't do my job, and this is one thing that I really got out of that listening to Rick Joyner, because one thing I like about Rick Joyner, he was a military man. He has military generals and colonels on his board. He gets high-end intel from, uh, from these generals that have contacts and connections. So I really respect him a lot for that. But the one thing he mentioned I thought was really good was the church is really good at teaching. We need to focus more on training. But then also we need to be deployed. You know, in the military, you spend, you know, my basic training was 16 weeks. But you normally spend eight weeks of basic training, being trained, right, for your job. When you start a new job, you, you need to be trained so you know what you need to do, right? You need to be taught. You need to be trained. And that takes time. Is it's the same thing with the church. You know, if we use those military concepts in the church, we've all been taught. We all know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We all know that there's no way to heaven except through him. We all know we need Jesus for salvation. That the world needs Jesus. We know a lot of the scriptures. We can recite them. Now we need to go and we start. We need to apply them in our lives. And that's what happened after you got done with basic training. Then you went to your division where you applied that training. Right? And when you're in that division, see, I served when it was peacetime. So we always had to be prepared. Right? The one thing about 82nd Airborne Division at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, it's not even called Fort Bragg anymore. I think they call it Fort Liberty. But it, I still, I'll still call it Fort Bragg. It's like Indians forever, brag forever, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's not the Red Hawks, it's the Indians for all of us, that, you know, all of my family that graduated from Owego. But one thing about Fort Bragg, the 82nd Airborne Division was being able to deploy anywhere in the world within 18 hours, I believe. 18 hours, you could be anywhere in the world during a conflict time. So you can just be dropped in at a drop zone, you go to your rally point, and then you know you get your get your mission, set up your base, and then go out from there and start looking for the enemy. Well, the church is in the same way. Just like we've been trained. Now we need to apply our training. When I served those three years, we applied that training over and over again. You know, it's, I also played football. It's like every time you go back and you start a whole new year of sports, it's like you got to start all over again. You're like, come on, let's get past this point so we can get these new plays, so we can learn these new things, right? But you apply that training, and you have to apply it over, and you repeat it, and you repeat it, and you repeat it. And you repeat it. And that's what I did for three years. I repeated my training for three years because I was never deployed because it was peacetime. I believe we're in the phase of the church where it's not, you know, we, we're, we're almost beyond the point of applying what we've learned. We're at the point where we need to be deployed. You know, you know at any minute, they would call it alerts, you know, or you would be, or get called out. So when you get, when you're on um, on call for the military, you have like two hours to get back in formation. You're not supposed to leave post. You got to be close by. You know, we're within that two hour frame right now where Jesus could be coming back, and it's like, you know what? It's time for you to be deployed. We need to be deployed into the world so that we can do 
everything that we've been taught. If you, I'm going to tell you all the things that we've been taught about Christianity and about life and about Jesus. If we never deploy it, it's like what Annie said. What are we doing? If we don't, you know, what are we doing? If we don't utilize it, what are we doing? Are we really, you know, are we really doing what Jesus called us to do? To go out and save the lost? To help the sick? To, to you know what I mean? Are, are we doing it? Or are we leaving church on Sunday, going home? You know, and I'm guilty of this. I'll leave church on Sunday. I'll go home. I'll sit down. I'll take a nap. Get up Monday morning. A new day starts until Saturday comes. You know, and I'm, I'm going to work every day. But we need to be able to learn how to take our training with us and what we've been taught to even our workplace and share because, you know, we know we need to make a living, right? God is Jehovah Jireh. We believe and we stand on him every day. But we still doesn't mean we go hide in our house and believe that God's just going to dump out all this money upon us so he can pay our bills because I'm standing in faith. No. God gives us things and instructions of what we should do and how we should live every day. So we need to take that training that we've lived Take it to the world. Take it to your workplace. Be a light shining in the darkness there. Standing on faith. You know, being thankful and having gratitude every day. You know, my mother-in-law always taught us one thing, Julie and I. When we would go down and she would give us counsel about things. Many times, you need to be thankful. Be thankful that you have a job. Be thankful that your kids are healthy and strong. Be thankful that you got a car. Be thankful that you got a home. Be thankful for all these little things, you know. And then God will start giving you bigger things and greater things. But thankfulness is huge. It's part of our training. You know, I can go to work and be a grump and be a jerk, you know, and be ungrateful. And I've done it. I'm guilty of it. But we need to be thankful. But I want to read to you the birth pains. I'm so far off my message. I have not even gotten past page two yet. So I've got seven pages of this. So I hope you got a fire under your butt, right? <laughs> but Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 through 8. Jesus replied to them, watch out that no one deceives you for many will come in my name saying I am the Messiah and they will deceive many you are going to hear of wars now I want you to just take in concept this was written 2,000 years ago this is what makes the Bible like no other book in the world okay 2,000 years ago Jesus is warning us about the time that we're living in now which is amazing. It's prophecy. You are going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed because these things must take place. So what's happening in the world right now is taking place because it must take place to fulfill Scripture. Because God's Word will never fail. Not one word will fall to the ground. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of labor pains. See? These are the birth pains. We're living in these times right now that the Bible prophesied about over 2,000 years ago. They're called the birth pains. That's what we're experiencing. But he's a promise there. These things must take place. Yet the end is not yet come. But the end is coming. And that's why we need to be prepared for what is coming. And I'm going to tell you, what's coming is Jesus for his church. Right? That's what's coming. And he's going to be coming for a faithful church. 
a faithful church, a church that's standing on the rock, a church that's not wavering to and fro, a church that's not being tossed by every wind of doctrine. We've been warned by Jesus that these things are going to happen. We have actually been at war, you know, for a long time in our nation. We have been in a spiritual battle for a long time. There has been a war on our nation, on your children, on your parents, on their grandparents, that goes way back for a long time. We have the attacks on the family. We have the attacks on birth. We have the tax all the way coming from the federal government all the way down to the state level and our governors on the families. We've called wrong right and right is wrong. Our colleges have become a place of propaganda to destroy our children and our grandchildren. What you can start seeing, there's hope out there because they're starting to get rid of some of these college professors and some of these college CEOs. They just fired the one in Harvard, or she stepped down. These are all tools of the enemy to destroy our children, they're to destroy our Christianity, they're attacks on our freedoms, attacks on our constitutions, attacks on our freedom of speech. These things are all happening. And they have been very successful in doing all these things. What we need to do as Christians is we need to shut the door, shut the door on the enemy. You know, I'm going to go off my notes again, but I can't help, what was I watching? I was watching some stupid show. And it was a guy who was trying to catch a red-tailed boa in the back of this lady's yard. Or, yeah, it was a guy, it was this, this, a guy's yard. And I want to ex just explain to you, you know, it's interesting, it's not by coincidence that the devil is called a serpent, right? He's a serpent. And I watched this guy with his, you got that little metal hook thing out there, you know, it's about three, four feet long, got a little L shape at the end to pinch and catch the head of this red tail bow and pull it out of these places. Well, I'm going to tell you, he went looking for that snake throughout that guy's yard, and he could not find it. But, oh, there was a little bitty hole in the fence. And that snake went in that little hole, and all he had was a tail, and he couldn't hold on to the tail because it was just too strong, you know, to pull it out. He only had about this much of the tail of this snake. The devil is no different than that. That's why they call the devil a serpent. He's a snake. He can find the littlest hole, the littlest crack in your foundation. And he can find a way into that house through just the smallest little hole. I was amazed to see this big boa go through the smallest little hole of that fence. And the guy couldn't get, then the guy had to jump the fence, tear apart the neighbor's fence. And he damaged her fat. He was breaking panels, like literally just snapping boards, to try to get to this stupid snake. I just think, just now in my mind, I think that's how vigilant we need to be about our family and our homes. We need to be that vigilant. When we see a foothold that the enemy can get in, or we see a crack in the foundation of our spiritual lives, of our family, especially you fathers that are heads of the family, your job, you know, you know, there's, you know, I look at it now and I think, duh, duh, the light just coming on. That's why God said, well, that's why I was taught as a kid. You need to be the provider and the protector of your family. 
The husband, the father, is the provider and the protector of the family. Just like God is the provider and the protector over the husband. Over the whole family unit, over the whole house. But God put you in charge to go route that snake out and go get that thing and get it the hell out of your house. Oops. <laughs> Oops, that's in the Bible. H E double hockey stick. <laughs> yeah. So you need to go out there and you need to route that thing out. And when you see a foothold there, we need to shut the door on the enemy. That's something we need to do. That's something as fathers we need to do. And God gave you a helper to help you remind you of that. Like my wife would remind me, did you read your word today? No, I did not. When are you going to read your word? And let's read it together. And thank God she does. That's part of our job. We've got to be militant about that. Militant about our training. Because we have been trained. You've been taught been trained, you know what to do, you got to apply the blood of Jesus, right? You got to cover your house with the blood of Jesus, cover your family with prayer. All of us need to be doing that, praying for one another in love, through faith. Because we are called to be warriors in Christ, for Christ Jesus. We're, we're, it's time for us to be deployed. It's time for the church to be deployed. And it might not be easy, but we got a handbook, you know. We got something that we need to dig into. If you're not rooted deep in Christ, if your foundation is not rooted in Christ, like it says in Colossians, if you're not rooted in Christ, then I suggest you go buy a shovel and a pick and you start getting rooted in Christ. And you just dig into that word. You dig into that thing. You get your foundation on solid ground. All right? You know, there's times, like I, I heard this one sermon uh, by this one gentleman that we listen to a lot, Joshua Selman. There's times when you're going to need to bank prayers. And what he was saying is like, there's, there's going to be a time in your life when you have all the time in the world to pray and to read the world. And then there's going to be times in your life where you don't have much time. But all those prayers and all that reading that you did, you're banking it. You're putting it away because you're going to need to pull it out and survive on some of those prayers and survive on, on that word that you put aside. You need to bank those prayers because we all get busy. Life happens to everything. Unexpected things happen to all of us. But that's why we bank them. That's why we read the word. And then we can continue to pray. The Bible actually says pray without ceasing. You need to learn, we need to learn how to pray all day long, even while we're here, not just here in church, not just home, but in the workplace. You know? The Bible also says that we need to be come together in songs and hymns and, and singing. That means when we gather together, we're coming to him to praise him. That's why I want to see everybody up and standing and praising, raising their arms. And we're not just doing it. You're not doing it to be seen. You're not doing it. You're doing it out of reverence to God, who is the creator, our father. You know, and I know that if some of you can't do it, that's totally understandable. But most of us here can get up and raise our hands to God and thank him and praise him for what he's done. We're still here. He gave us this breath that we're breathing today, and that our family's healthy and strong, and that our guinea pig has babies. <laughs> right, Ollie? That's right. So praise the Lord. God is good. Amen. I'm going to stop right there, because I got, I got more I can share on it, and I'll save it for next week, because I know it's getting late. But God is good all the time. You know, he is our Jehovah Jireh. And I probably need to be reminded of that more than any of you out there. <laughs> but we all do. But I want you to be I want you to think about your this sermon today and think about how God can deploy you in your workplace, in your life, 
Uh, how God can deploy you and use you when you're not just here in church, you know, not just playing the guitar or singing or drums or anything else, but how God can use you to help somebody else. Amen? How he can deploy you. What's your calling? Do you guys know what you're called to do? Do you know what your calling is? Do you, do you have a feeling like, I don't know what my calling is. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Well, then we need to pray. Because what we need to do mostly is hear the voice of God so we can get clear direction. I believe in what's coming on this world. If you're not close to God and get direction, you can be done. You know? We need to stay close to God so we can hear, okay, Lord, I need to, like that little boy did in the video who was blind, you know, he would stop, look up, okay, Lord, move over to the right a couple feet and dig. That's how close of a relationship we need to be to God so we can hear his voice, so we can get clear direction of where we need to go. And God is always speaking to us. We just need to listen. He's always speaking we just need to clear our minds and our thoughts so we can listen to him. Because I'm going to tell you, the enemy, when you think you're getting quiet and alone with God, the enemy will bring every thought that you can possibly think of. As an example, I'll be like, okay, I'm going to be quiet with God. I'm going to pray. I come down and I do it all the time. I come down and pray and I say, okay, God, I'm going to get quiet, pray. I'm going to write my sermon. I'm going to read your word. I'm going to pray some more. And then I'll be like, did you check the heater? You need to go check the heater. Well, I turned it on. Did you turn the lights on? Did you turn the sound system? I mean, all these stupid things go through your mind. It's like I did that. Check, 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 check. You know what I mean? And it takes up your time. It takes up your thought process. It makes you think, did I do that? Did I not do that? Or should I put salt down on the walkways? Or is it, there was no squalls when I came down and you know, all these little stupid things that just consume our minds, that's, you know, the hardest thing to do is control your mind and say, Lord, I need you to stop this right now so I can have a clear thought so I can hear from you. Amen? All right, so so let's bow. Did you have anything you wanted to comment on or anything? No? Let's bow our heads. Father, I just pray in Jesus' name that, Lord, you are, are the author and perfecter of our faith, that you are, Lord God, here with us where two or more are gathered. I pray that you would help us this week as we leave here to go out into the world to do your will. Help us to do your will. I pray that we would bind up the enemy in Jesus' name and cast them out of our thoughts, out of our minds, out of our homes and our families, that we would apply the precious blood of Jesus over our homes, over our families, over our lives, over our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, our mothers, our fathers, our grandparents, Lord God, that we would apply the precious blood of Jesus over each one of us, that we may be protected and kept from the evil one who's out there trying to distract us. We bind them up and we cast them out in Jesus' name. The only name that has power, that power in Jesus' name. And I just thank you, Lord, for this day. I pray for each person here, Lord God, that you would bless them abundantly and speak to them. Help us to hear your voice. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.